very much. I'm, I'm hoping that my mic's working. Is that working? Is everybody hearing? That's good. Okay, so... Is the loop okay? <laughs> okay, we're good. So, um, I'll start off, I'll tell you a little bit about me first. Um, of course, it's not hard to tell where I'm from. Uh, the accent gives it away straight away. I'm from the northeast of England, near Newcastle. Um, and we're proud of our beaches over there. Uh, we like our coast a lot, but most of it is very nice as well on this side. And um, I started off sort of within conservation and ecology. I was working at the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust for a little while, um, working with waterfowl and um, catching American mink and some things that, um, related to that. Uh, and, and while I was there, I got into aquatic ecology. Started a master's degree at Lancaster University, um, done a lake ecology module, love freshwater ecology, um, and then started getting into projects with microplastics as part of that master's, uh, as part of that master's degree. So this was the project, it was the uptake and impact of microplastics on aquatic macroinvertebrates in Morecambe Bay. And I'll go into what that all means, macroinvertebrates is more than just a mouthful. It's, um, it's, I think it's something, so I was talking to my nan and granddad uh, the other week, uh, we're having a cup of coffee, I go around there every Friday uh, normally, and my granddad was talking about when we used to go to the Lake District, because we would always camp in the Lake District rather than like going abroad or anything like that, we'd normally go camping, and my granddad was talking about when, when he was younger and they would drive around the Lake District, there'd be loads of bugs on the windshield, all over the place, and these days you don't see so many, and some of these flies and these little bugs and if you go up the Menic Hills up in Scotland, you've got loads of midges and they're a bit annoying, they bite you and nip you and all of these little animals that live around where some of them start their lives in water at like the larval stage. So these are the animals that I'm talking about and some more familiar things like mussels and cockles and whelks and things that are around Morgan Bay that I'm sure many people are familiar with. And, and, and it's about where they sit in the food chain and why they're important because they're at the base of the aquatic food chain and anything that happens to them impacts the rest of their and the rest of the ecology around them the entire food web including us all the way up to us and the areas of science that this breaks down into break down into the guys who are involved in the project or my supervisory team and um, it's a big one so i've got hydrogen fuchsmeyer and she's a lady ecologist um, and Steve Thackeray, he's also a lake ecologist, a lake biologist, and these are both sitting in the UK Centre of Ecology and Hydrology, which is based at Lancaster University. We've got Ben Surridge, and he's a biogeochemist at Lancaster University, and he sits in Lancaster Environment Centre. And you've got Rob Short, who is a material scientist, and he used to be in Lancaster, but unfortunately he's just recently left us. He's just gone to Sheffield University, looking for them because Rob's great. And those three areas of science where, is where this sits under. It's, it's lake ecology and biogeochemistry, the movement of a material, not quite a nutrient, it's a little bit different, but then the, the material, which is the plastic, comes under that, that material science. Um, and this is how it's going to go. So in the first part, I'll talk about plastics and how they break down into microplastics, the sources, the transport, we'll talk a little bit about the fate and how where they end up in the environment and why, and to what extent the animals are impacted by them, their interactions, maybe some disagreements, not everybody agrees, because it's a fairly new field of research in terms of the grand scheme of things. And then in the second part, we'll talk about the macroinvertebrates and microplastics again, the uh, main theme of the talk, and then we'll think about the animals that are eating the plastics in the bay and some future research and some other things that are going on around Cumbria and things like that as well. Firstly though, I want to talk to you about plastics. So, I mean, everybody knows what plastics are, you see them every day, everywhere you look there's plastics, they're incredibly useful, they're incredibly adaptable, and around the turn of the 1950s, plastics really boomed off, chemists seen that plastics were a, a really um, useful uh, polymer, it was this thing that you could mold into different shapes, and the scene around the natural world that animals had shells and had carapaces and chitin and things that were made out of polymers 
And then they looked at these polymers and thought maybe we could do something like that. And the, the material that we made is a byproduct from the petrochemical industry. It's, it's inherently linked to that. And there's people that know a lot more about that than me in terms of the linkages and, and, and the push towards that. But the first thing I want to say is that plastic's incredibly useful. I think when we look around, all of the things that we use plastic for and some of the advancements within science, particularly within medicine, wouldn't have been capable without plastics. They wouldn't have been doable. If you look at this picture, almost everything here is made up of plastics, right down to the guy's lab coats. But some of those things are saving people's lives. And I don't know if the benefit of plastic, I don't know if, if, I don't know if I'm saying that right, I don't know if the benefits of plastic outweigh the negatives, but I think, I think you could argue the two. And, and that's where I want to start this, because this is by no means an attack on plastics, because it might be that they have pushed us forward further than they would have set us behind. But on the other hand, we just waste a little bit too much, and I'm not best for it, I'm not preaching to anybody. I do go to Costa and I'll get a coffee cup, or I'll get a disposable sandwich, and I'll get a the wrapper, and I'll try to think about it most of the time, but realistically, I'm not the best person in the world, and I don't claim to be. Um, there's definitely people that are better than me at it. This is just something I research. I look at the, I was interested in the animals at first, and the plastics came later, and I hope we'll be better, but I think we should use them. <clears throat> because of the 400 million tons of plastic that we do produce yearly, about half of that is manufactured for single use. So, and, and globally, 32% of plastic is recycled, which is better than I actually thought originally, um, I must say. And this little chart on this side here, this, just, this is just the different plastics that are, that are made. We'll, we'll, We'll learn a lot more about them. Some people know more about them than, than others. But you know, you've got polyethylene, that might ring a bell. You've got polypropylene, polyvinyl chloride, PVC, windows, polyurethane, PET, polystyrene. Um, we'll get into them, but <clears throat> the point of the matter is, is that although plastic's very useful, maybe we are a little bit more wasteful than, than we should be. But we'll talk about what happens with plastic. So plastic doesn't break down. These natural things that break down in the environment, the reason they do that is because organisms have the tools to break them down. So when you introduce something new into these ecosystems, these new things, on the, the, the organisms that exist there don't have the tools to break these things down. So plastics break down in microplastics, and how that happens is through a few things, through mechanical damage. So if you've got litter rolling around, you know, it breaks apart, it'll break apart even further, wind and rain and all that stuff. But then you've also got UV radiation from the sun, which causes something called photooxidation on the surface of the material. And what this means is, is that it's breaking down the plastic slowly over time, and it changes the way that that plastic maybe takes in and, and, and puts out the chemicals into the world. <clears throat> and a few other sources of these microplastics are fibers from our clothing. Um, I don't think I've got any on us today that wasn't deliberate, um, but, Lots of our clothing is covered in fibres and we'll go into the, the difficulties with fibres when you start to try and do experiments with these things because we are people doing experiments and plastics are just about everywhere so contamination is a nightmare. And we've got degraded tyres and road markings so <clears throat> this is just another thing to think about because roads and cars are everywhere and primary microplastics which are now the beads are now banned in the UK, which is great, but you still see beads in samples, and there's loads of other different versions of primary microplastics that are made. And um, these are some of the sources of where these things come from, because plastics break down. In terms of the sizes that we're talking about, it's less than five millimeters. So these are really, really, really small. Um, and in some cases, we'll go down to the nano scale. So these macroplastics, these are these are much bigger. This is just in term, to get an idea of the sort of things that these animals are eating because that macro part of the macro invertebrate, that's referring to its size. So it's like about this big, but it could be like this big. So it's like somewhere between there and there. And, and these microplastics are obviously a lot smaller than that. It's, it's just trying to get an idea of these sizes because we'll be talking about some of the trophic groups that are perhaps below or above these animals as well. 
So once we produce all these plastics, <clears throat> the, and we recycle 32% of them, and some of the ones we use, the other half we will we'll continuously use, and there's some of the variations of that. Um, they can be transported throughout the environment. So we'll manufacture textile clothing, we'll manufacture bigger plastics, or there's some of these, these small micro beads, we'll manufacture those as well. And they're broken down, they break down the environment, we've got all of this, these mechanical damages and UV aging happening, and in that time, they're breaking down the microplastics and they're transported all over the shop. So, from industrial and domestic sources, that's the main source, and those are on land, and we can get plastics from that way into our uh, water streams, um, from, from our fresh water into our marine, we can get coastal deposition as well. Um, a big source of plastics that we know of, or that's been shown in some studies, is of wastewater treatment works, um, and we'll, we'll go into that. And the idea is, is that plastics are basically ubiquitous wherever, wherever we look, them for, look for them, we'll find them. And um, for example, in sea ice, a high concentration of plastic debris, so 40 to 250 microplastics per melted sea ice stored in Arctic sea ice. So when you think about that, and the amount of people that are perhaps around those regions, then you start to think, okay, plastics are pretty much everywhere. And that slide was going to be a few earlier on, but never mind. <clears throat> so with the way it works, we do a good job of removing lots of plastics in the process. So we remove 80 to 99% of the plastics and the sewage treatments, it's stored in the sewage sludge, um, and we take that out. Uh, we'll do different things to that chemically, uh, I'm no expert on that or anything like that, but we we'll reapply that stuff to the land, and then eventually some of those microplastics that are in that sewage sludge go back into the rivers, go back into the streams, go back into the lakes, and end up back in our ecosystems. So we've got some lessons to learn and some things to do, but for the most part, we do our best. In the lower atmosphere, we've got 0.3 to 1.5 microplastics per cubic meter, and that's pretty good. Comparing that indoor air, if you had a light in here, and if that shined, or maybe if you can see on the projector, I'm not sure, you might see loads of particles through here, and included in that would be approximately 30 to 60 microplastics per cubic meter. So a meter like that, 30 to 60. So these things are just about everywhere. And the main start of the talk, uh, I mentioned aquatic macroinvertebrates, and that's what we're talking about, some of the marine and some of the freshwater. And because 50% of the human population live le less than 90 miles from the coast, uh, our waters, particularly rivers and particularly lakes, are heavily polluted with microplastics in terms of concentration. And from marine to freshwater, 4.8 to 12.7 billion tons of plastic is brought into the marine environment, and that's where this link happens from marine, from marine freshwater, from freshwater to marine, sorry. And so, in that, you can see that the different spheres of the environment start to link up to each other in terms of the movement of plastic uh, around these different ecosystems, and so. What this shows is, and this isn't mine, this is Frederick Winter, he was a PhD student not long ago, uh, just, just before me, I think three or four years ago before me, um, and he studied the same topic that I'm studying, and he put this forward and looked at certain research fields, and we as freshwater ecologists were excited to see this because we've got something to look at, because these dark black arrows, these represent where the, the, the information that we know is quite well understood in terms of the movement between those areas. And the grey arrows are those that where it, it's, it's, it's less defined in terms of the, the exact processes of plastics moving throughout the environment. And so when you look at that, you can quite clearly see that there's uh, an underrepresentation in the freshwater environment and this, this extra environment, which I've included, because we're going to be looking at Morgan Bay. Um, and so that's how these different spheres of the environment connect together. There's loads of other different things that move like this. There's nutrients and there's, 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 different, there's different contaminants within the environment, but 
Plastics follow a similar method to them. Now, once the plastics are in the environment, where these organisms live, there's a whole host of interactions that goes on in terms of where the plastics end up and why they end up there. Now, this picture is really blurry on this screen. I'm sorry, that's probably hurting some people's eyes. Um, I'm doing a good job. I'll try and do a good job of explaining it instead. So, there's loads of stuff going on here, but the idea is, is that once plastics are in here, depending on the density of them, and it's different for freshwater and for marine environments, because the density of freshwater and the density of salty water are, are different because of that salt. So plastics sit in and around that density. Some of them are a little bit more dense. They'll sink into the sediment fairly quickly. Those that are less dense will sit on top of the water column and might sink over time because some of the microorganisms that live inside the water will colonize the surface of the plastic. When that happens, when this colonization happens, they're creating this little ecosystem and they help to break apart these plastics but they increase the density and eventually, even our less dense plastics end up in the sediment. So the movement of plastic is really dependent upon the animals that live there, but there's these microorganisms that live in all the aquatic environments that we're talking about. And, <clears throat> that in, and, and if we include, if we, if we think back to the UV agent and the bringing down of plastics all included, pretty much every day ends up in the bottom and then you've got all the movement around. And most of the organisms that I'm talking about are down here at 15 and 16, 17 as well. And these are the macro and communities. We've got some sediment on them once, and we'll be talking about some, uh, some ones that live throughout the water column, and we'll be talking about their feeding habits. Uh, in the second part of the lecture, we'll go into more detail about that. And uh, this is just really giving you a background on the, on the plastics to get everybody on the same page. These animals form the base of this aquatic food web, and these white lines are the direct uptake of plastics. Then from there, it moves out to other places. There's fish that eat some of these animals, and there's, there's, there's bigger, different invertebrates that eat them, and it breaks all the way up into the, the wider food chain. And, and, and that's the, the, the main thing that we're looking at. So it's, it's this picture, but then it links in everything else because there's indirect uptake through that. And I'll show you some examples. Now, In terms of why these animals take up the plastics, this is pretty well understood. So we've gotten that thought for sure. Because microplastics are ubiquitous in the environment, saying say that word, I say it loads now, uh, and I've never used it before, I started this. So I've got loads more vocabulary now that I'm doing this <laughs> nice little page thing. So yeah. And the, um, the thing with that is that basically it seems as though the more that the animal interacts with plastic, the more opportunity it be, it's, it's around it, obviously, then it's just going to take it up. We're the same, and, never, and all these animals are the same. If it's there, it's probably just going to happen. But the main reason, or the main thing that governs why the plastic is taken up, is based on its size and morphology. And it's for shape, size and shape. Because with that, these, there's two things going on. One is that some of these organisms mistake the particles for food. So if something looks like a uh, Malteser and it smells a bit like Malteser because it's covered in Malteser chocolate, then I might pick it up and eat a thing that's Malteser. But with these animals, it's the same thing. Instead, it's these biofilms or these microorganisms that colonize the surface of these particles. So they'll take it up and stick it into food. Um, <clears throat> or they'll just accidentally take it up because they're a filter feeding animal and they take up all sorts of stuff and this is just one of the things that were there whilst they were trying to eat or dine. And, and that's really the main thing. That's the main thing in terms of why they take them up. There's, there's other things in, in terms of different feeding types and, 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 all, these, and all these things, but it's, it's really the size and shape and, and, and where the plastic is. So, if there's places where there's more depth, there's more plastic, if there's places where there's more of one type of plastic, then of course they might be taking up more of those materials. It doesn't mean that they're more, the, it doesn't mean that those materials are worse for that animal, it just means that that animal is in contact with those materials. I think is what I'm trying to say, but it'll become clearer because that's a bit of a point here. 
<coughs> and what we're looking at on this side here, um, on the top right, is some particles, some fragments, and some fibers. Because there's a big difference between these. Um, the, the particles and fibers are, are, are also consumed in, in, in various ways. But these fibers are particularly bad for mechanical damage of some of these animals because they're entangled, because these are really, really, really small. You can't see this probably, but that says 100 microns, and that's just, doesn't matter how small, really, really, really small. So these fibers can wrap around different things inside these animals and cause constraints and things like that, and we'll go into detail. And um, this, is the in, this is inside of these shrimp, and what, what happened here is, Microplastics were stained with a fluorescent dye that were put inside the prey of the mesoshrimp, shrimp, and then the mesoshrimp shrimp were left with that prey, and then the, 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 the inside the mesoshrimp shrimp was shown, and it showed that the fluorescent phase were taken up. So you can see that animals are taking up plastics, and then those are being passed on from one trophic level to the next. And Sorry, my mouth is awfully dry. <laughs> I don't mean you take a drink. And when that's happening, so there's plastics everywhere, the animals are taking up a lot, and they're eating a lot. So what's it doing? Is there something going on? Does it matter? Do they just pass through? Do they just ingest them? And this is where we're starting to get down to it, really, <clears throat> because there is negative impacts on the growth, survival, reproduction, and cross-generational of these animals because of the plastics and some of the associated chemicals that are with them. And we'll go into both of those, because not everybody agrees here, and this is the part where there is some disagreement. And I think, actually, it just looks normal. It just looks like a normal field of research, which would normally happen. Um, but for the, for the general part, we know the primary endpoints are the things that are mostly impacted for different trophic levels, for the microbes, it's the taxon richness, for the primary producers, which is our algae species, so we'll see like bigger and smaller versions of those, it's their focus and their activity, their ability to survive. For primary consumers, it's the growth and mortality, um, and for uh, secondary consumers, it's growth, mortality, and reproduction, and those growth, mortality, and reproduction are things to do with Endocrine disrupting chemicals, which we'll talk about in a moment. But for most organisms, the impacts are unknown. That's the truth. There's studies for lots of different organisms, and um, there's just a lot of different animals, so it's hard to do that. And one thing I want to stop first and say here, yeah, because I know that when I'm talking about this, there's a real inclination to think about human health in all of this, because you think, oh God, well, what's it doing with the animals, what's it doing with us then? Who's doing what? Who's getting impacted, and how bad is it? And there is implications for human health. It's not like we can compare the impact on the animals to our health. That's not realistic. The way they live, and their ecologies, and their biologies are totally different to ours. But what's important for them is because they're based their aquatic food chain, and then they impact the rest of the food chain. For us, it's more that these chemicals are the things that impact us the most. So this is not my field of research. I don't look at human health. There is a doctor called Shanna Swan who looks at human health, and she looked at phthalates, or it's an awkward word to say, it's like phthalates, something like that. And these are plasticizers. Normally when you look at plastics, thank you for the water. Normally when you look at plastics, and you've got these phthalates in them, they're normally, the plastic will be bendy. So the plasticizers give the plasticity, and it becomes bendy. And that's what phthalates are, and that's what they're used for, and that's why they use them. But <clears throat> they're an endocrine disrupting chemical. There's health impacts that are happening to that. And I think in Dr. Shanna Swan work, what she looked at was, or the way she described it, I should say, is that when you understand that the amount of tubes going into a baby when a baby needs to be fed in a hospital, when you can correlate the direct amount of phthalates 
to the amount of tubes that are going into the baby, then you can understand that the plastic is allowing phthalates into the human body. So that happens, and <clears throat> she talks about, in her work, issues with reproduction. Again, that's not my work. I just want to say that and get it out, because I feel as though whenever I start to think about these things, I can't help but think about human health. I'm not talking about that, but just to put that out there. There's all sorts of other ones. So there's hardness, bisphenols, BPA, you might have heard BPA, BPA-free bottles, you hear about bottle BPA-free bottles, you know, what's why you want a BPA-free bottle, I don't know. But bisphenols, um, which is BPA, these bottles, now you'll see the BPA-free bottle, it doesn't mean that it's bisphenol-free, it means that it's BPA-free, but BPF and BPS are just the same in terms of toxicity, but um, you just need to check it's not got those things as well. It might still matter, sometimes worse, the impacts, I'm not too sure about it anyway. So, hardness, flame retardants, fatness, and, and synthetic dyes, these are, these are all uh, additives that can be added to the plastic, and these cause some of the health impacts, um, and, and they're associated things. But they're not the only thing, because it's, it's long thought that maybe that in this field of, of plastic research, that what we're looking at is just toxic chemicals that are included in the plastics. We'll remove the toxic chemicals, we'll put something else in them. Maybe that will get something that's less toxic. Um, but when we're talking about the health of these organisms, pristine plastics can still be an impact. So this is a study, and it's a busy slide, but I'll break it down. Don't worry about this, this is just the title of the author. And all of the stuff I'll uh, add together, and me and Jan can talk through, and we'll put these slides together, and I can hand them to anyone. Um, there's a few that I'll remove, and I'll show you some. Um, this was a study, and this is on some of the animals that we're looking at. These are called coronamids, or blood worms, or midgy fly larvae, non-biting midges, so not like the ones in the medic hills in Scotland that annoy you. These don't bite you. And at their larval stage, so this is their life stage at the top, at their larval stage, which is this red one, because they've got hemoglobin in their long, thin bodies. Um, they live in, can live in polluted areas uh, because of that. And in this stage, um, they have four instars, four developmental stages. And that's what these are referring to. Number one's not on here because they didn't look at it. Two, three, and four. So the way that we determine the size of these animals, or the way that we determine the install that, of these animals, is by the size of the head capsule. The head size capsule determines the size of the entire animal. It's the best way to do it. So what they're looking at here is the head size capsule. And then on the bottom is the size of the microplastics that they were inside these little microcosms with these animals. And in this study, they've seen that uh, a size of 10 to 27, uh, the animals are in the same conditions at the same time, the growth of that animal is impacted. They only get their third, uh, their third install, which is their third life stage. Um, uh, in, it was a five day growth essay, they don't have long life periods, uh, and some of these comments have shorter again. Um, so best be looking after them. So uh, these of them, it's not uh, the best selfie in the world, but this is its antenna, and it's a terrible, terrible picture. This is, it, it's really great because it, it does prove it, but it shows like there's malformations on the animal in terms of the size of the antenna, and that's what they looked at, and that's with pristine microplastics, because there's some mechanical damage going on. And it's difficult to understand exactly what's going on. Now, in terms of some of these different trophic animals that I keep banging on about, that we've got these macroinvertebrates, and comparatively to the plastics that we're talking about, they're kind of over here at the ingestion side. So this is the part that they're looking at. And this is just a figure from one of Windsor's papers. And when we see this, we can see that on the other side, where the colonization is going on, where I'm talking about these microorganisms, these organisms that colonize the surface of the plastic, that create that ecosystem, that's, that's where they are. And this is how the impacts go across. So that's just for scale, just for reference, just to sort of drive that home. And this is 
just how that looks in terms of impact. It's loads of words, but this is the sort of thing I'm talking about in terms of the scale of the impact on the communities, or the animals, or their, their ecologies. Um, this is the processes that are taking place. So you've got colonization, that's how the microorganisms go around the surface of the plastic. You've got entanglement, physical blockage, abrasive damage, uptake across membranes and chemical leaching. And then the effect pathway is what potentially can impact their, how that can impact their, their, their ecosystem structure, their population demo, demo, demography. Demo, demo. I can't say that. I'm not even going to try it another time. I'll let you read that one. <laughs> the, the, the mortality growth and immune responses. And I know this one's a little bit more boring. All I'm doing here is just putting the background that I think is fairly needed just to go through the Morgan Bay study and to go through all that stuff and why it's quite exciting and quite important. Um, this is now getting towards the end of this section. And um, the stuff that I've shown you is the, the, the experiments are, are really good and, and they're solid, I would say. And one of the things with looking at microplastics in terms of the impact on animal health, in the grand scheme of things, it's a new field, maybe it's like 30, 40 years old, 30 years old maybe. And because of that, what we do when we start looking at some of these things, we start to decide or we'll pick a set of variables that we think are important to make these experiments work. And so there's a certain set of variables. You might pick th three, you might pick four. You'll do an experiment. And then at that point, once you've done that experiment, you can put out the data and say, right, this is what I know now from this experiment, which is great. And that doesn't prove anything. And that's because of the scientific method. Because the way the scientific method goes, and me and Jan, we, we do, uh, so Jan started my page, page, her page at the same time as me. So we spend a lot of time in these classes on a Friday, half three or half five, talking about loads of different things and future places and what the world would look like without plastic and all these other things. And you get thrown into them, you do. First you say, oh, I'm not sure if I want to do them because it's extra work. But then when you're there, you do, you end up enjoying them. That's truth. And we talk about all this stuff. And one of the things we talk about was the scientific method. And with the scientific method, you start off, you make a guess. It's called a hypothesis. It's an informed guess based on the information you've got. I'm not dumbing this down. This is just to put everything in context of this field. So you make an informed guess. And from that informed guess, you say, right, this is what the world would look like if that guess was true. And then you say, OK, I'll set up a set of experiments to determine if that's the case. These are the things that are included, and this is what it's going to say. So you get a lot of results. And in the early stages of microplastics, we're seeing incredibly bad impacts here, there, and everywhere, because people weren't using, the, or weren't using all of the variables. Or they were doing something in a lab, and you had a few variables, and really in the real world, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot closer to, to, to chaos. So it's, it's harder to try and compare these two things. So that's right, those studies weren't bad, those studies were good, those studies are what the normal evolution of a scientific field looks like. That's the way it should be, because then somebody will build on that and build on that, we include more variables and things go in that direction. Well, that's how I see it anyway. And I think that that pretty much sums up the research field or the research that is important to what we'll be looking at. And that's the first part of the lecture. Um, this is a good time to stop. If that's good for you, we can have a break and then we'll go into the second part afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so this is the second part. Um, the first part's a little quick, I'm trying to get that all in. Um, so this is my PhD, so this is what I'm looking at. To look at microplastics in Morgan Bay um, and in some surrounding areas to going all the way to Windermere. You see, we're mostly freshwater ecologists. So looking at the marine side was a little tricky for us because we had to learn a thing or two about where these marine animals might be. Um, 
and you'll, that, that'll be reflected in the data. You'll see the freshwater side is better than the marine side. <laughs> and um, the first one I'm going to talk about is the impact and up, uh, the uptake of microplastics by the animals in the bay. The second part I'll talk about is some of the impacts, not with the chemical side, um, some of the impacts just in terms of how the animals take them up, why they might, and, and an experiment that I've got in plan. And, and then I'll, I'll also have a, a little chat about Phyto, this, this project called the Phytoplastic Project. And this is a European project, and Windermere is included in it. And, um, and that's looking at the growth of some of these algae on some of the bigger plastics, just, just normal size plastics, any, any size. So this is Morgan Bay. Um, I'm sure everybody in this room is familiar with Morgan Bay. Uh, it's the largest expanse of mudflats in the UK, incredibly important for migratory and wind birds and etc. And, and, and you obviously all know this. And obviously we've got the, the Levin River, the Kent, the Loon and the Wire, and various regions around the bay. And it's also the home of many of these macroinvertebrates that we've been talking about. So because of the coastal marine water and the freshwater rivers that come into the bay, We've got this brackish region where some animals like to live. It's a little bit of a niche for them, that particular place where they want to be. And what we did was we went all we went to these four rivers in the bay, and we looked at the freshwater, the brackish water, and the marine animals, and we looked at the microplastic uptake and whether they were retaining the particles. Um, and there were 765 individuals, that's how many animals were in the study, 11 different taxonomic families. And we'll go through the method and how that, how that works and, and what we got out of that as well. Um, of course, I don't need to explain it that too much. Um, so this is the method of, of, of how, we, how we did it. And, and I'm, I'm gonna go through it with you um, because I think it's important to understand how, in terms of how important the results are, and whether or not I'm talking nonsense or not. So the first thing we did is a kick sample, and it's as interesting as it sounds. You know what? This is what I'm going to show you. Because I just realised we don't have audio. But you might be able to hear it. It's just a tune anyway. Audio. Right. Okay. I'll show you this video first. Right, I didn't make that video, that's really cringy that. <laughs> so, so, I'll click back on this. Okay, so, I'll, I'll go into the details with the, the microscope and, and some of the things in and, and some areas in that science, which is a little bit, um, there's a little bit of background to give in there. But the idea is that we went out and collected these animals so you do a kick sample with a net. This is for some of them, of course. That's not the case for mussels or cockles or whelks. You have to find them. Lugworms, you have to dig them up. And we collected these animals from around the bay. And we kept them in filtered water. And we, in that filtered water, they were in jaws and then we brought them back to the lab. And I'll get into the rest in a second. The one thing that I want to say is that when we're out there and when you're looking at some of these pictures and it's impossible not to notice and it's one of the things that we'll start talking about in the beginning is the use of plastic around the world and of course in this project I've had to rely on plastic for a lot of things and we're in wellies in that which are causing contamination. That's a plastic tray. There's some plastic used throughout the entire experiment and so what we'll have to do is, is create loads and loads of controls to make sure that 
we understand the level of con contamination and we we'll understand at what stages when the, where the contamination comes from and whether it's not from the samples or whether it's from other things that are inside of any of the environments or in my lab or, or in anything. So that's important to note. Um, once we've got these animals, we take these back to the lab, um, we allow them to clear their guts and <coughs> All that means is that they're pooing out all of the stuff that they would normally poo out. And so they clear their guts, we take them animals out of that water, that's now a separate sample, and inside that is the, the amount of plastic that is excreted from this animal, and then the animals, we then dissect them, so we kill them with ethanol, we dissect them, and then they are digested to have, and what that means is, is that we use a chemical to remove all of the animal with the goal of leaving behind just plastic. So you've got no animal left in just plastic. And this method is invasive and these animals die as part of this experiment. So in, in that, and, and I'll, I'll, go into that, I'll go into the details of that and the, the, the ethics behind that and everything. So in that, um, when, when we've digested these and we leave behind these plastics, essentially what we have now is, is just all of these microplastics on, on a filter paper, so we've removed everything, we've got rid of all, the majority of the organic material, but it's, it's a difficult thing to do if you want to leave behind just the plastics. So, it's, so we'll have to think about that a little bit. But once we've done that, we can see these plastics, we'll stain them with a dye, and then we'll look at them on the fluorescent microscope, and we can see, because the dye only or should bind to a hydrophobic environment, which is the plastics, um, but it depends on how broken down the plastic is. So we're getting an estimation of what plastics look like there. So that's why when we get this fluorescent microscope, so there's another step. So, because it seems as okay, now we've broken down all the organic material, and we've got now there's plastics, we can just look at those, but we really need to confirm whether that's the case. So on a subset of some samples, we look at these on micro FTIR, and we're seeing a classification of what their plastics actually are, um, depending on different, different, to compare them to a library of, of plastics that we have. Well, I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to do that. Oh, the rest is done. We're nearly there. <coughs> these pictures are just some of the issues that I'm talking about. So these are plastics, these are plastic fibres from some of the animals from today. Um, we'll talk about the animals in a minute. We've got fragments and I've zoomed out on this picture here on this microscope. The reason being is because you can see that if somebody is looking at those and counting those, then that's, they're going to get it wrong. So you have, to, uh, you have to do two things. One, have machine help you and two, have people help you to make sure that you can see what plastics are on there. And of course, we make sure that there's no organic material which might still be there with our digest, um, which is why we do the FTIR. Um, these are just the, the science events. And these are the plastics that we we'll see in some of these cases. With some of these have been checked when we've got um, some PET, which is part of a plastic bottle, um, and, some, and a nylon fiber in one case as well. So that's what we found in Morgan Bay. Lots of animals were uptaking lots of plastic. It seemed to be a lot to do with the, the feeding behaviour, um, and there's lots of other things. And this thing that I was talking about at the beginning, about this in, in the first part, about the, the scientific method when you drill down, it's also about trying to get closer and closer and closer to what's happening in the, the tiny little interactions. You can't say, you can't, you can't explain everything by the tiny interactions, but you can't explain everything by looking at the whole picture, you have to use both and bring them together. So we're going a little bit further down anyways. So when the animals are taking up some of these plastics, um, we talk about these little ecosystems that are living on them, and they keep bringing up names for stuff, people call them biofilms or the plastosphere, or it's essentially just the microorganisms that colonize the surface of the plastic. There's all sorts of different things. And and what's happened, this is, this is a figure, it's, it's not necessary to understand, but the idea is, is that this ecocrona colonizes the, or, or attaches to the surface of the particle, this free floating stuff, then the, the organisms come and um, adhere to that, and then on this 
material, they excrete their sting from within the cells, and that's this EPS, this extracellular polymer polymeric substances, things from within the cells. That them, they form this biofilm, and then that's what's happening with these materials. And why I'm telling you this is for what I'm doing as part of my second experiment. The animal here doesn't matter, um, but the idea is that some, when these particles are in the environment, um, they're colonized by biofilms, they uptake them, and there's various reasons as to why they might uptake certain plastics over other plastics, because the chemistry of the plastics are fairly different. And those people I was telling you about at the beginning, those lady ecologists, those material scientists, and those biogeochemists, they tend to look at the world in different ways. And so if you ask any one of them about the problems to do with this, they'll all have different opinions. And so that's really important to know because that's what we're looking at here and it sets up for the experiment and as to what's going on. This is just looking at that same animal um, and looking at the uptake of plastics in here um, and uptake of organic material. This is from the study that we were looking at before. It's just a, a picture of that in, in terms of, of what we're talking about, but then going into the real, the real world. So, <clears throat> those people who look at the world differently, um, they'll have different perspectives on as to what's going on with the uptake of plastics, or why certain animals, why certain microorganisms colonize one plastic, or why the interactions happen in a certain way. And I'm going to be looking at three plastics: PET, so your plastic bottles, polylactic acid, PLA, which is a biodegradable material, and nylon. It's a version nylon, nylon six for chemists but it's nylon, and with these three plastics, what I'll be doing is, is looking at the organisms that colonise the surface of them, and if they're different and why. Now, we know some bits about that, because we've got to do that inside of any sort of medical research, if you think of, why, of how they have to keep things sterile, or why they might not want certain organisms to do well on certain surfaces. We, we do that with lots of things. Um, but in this case, we're looking to break down the plastics. So we're taking these plastics, we're allowing them to be UV aged. Um, so this is what we're talking about at the beginning when the plastics break down through UV aging. We're doing that, but we're doing that ourselves. And then these are going to go in different parts. So there's three boys that we work with, there's no contamination in this river. We're not doing anything like that. These three places, so it's the Levin River, Morgan Bay, and then the South Basin of Windermere. We're going to be looking at the different micro communities that will colonize these plastics and why they might be different and why these people might disagree is because a material scientist will focus solely on the material of, of the plastic. They'll say that of course it's going to be different because all of those plastics will age differently and once they've aged differently, the organisms that heal those surfaces will be different because, um, because different organisms prefer different surfaces and it depends on different hydrophobicities and which is hydro meaning water and phobicity meaning fear enough. So depending on the, the way these animals interact in these scenarios, the surface will be different. If you ask maybe somebody more in the realm of environmental science or something a little bit more strict, let's say something, so, sorry, was that, was that someone? Someone say something? No. Oh, no? <laughs> uh, sorry, I, I must move my mind. Uh, so somebody in the realm of, uh, in that realm, or somebody that works with, or a lady ecologist, or somebody that works with the microorganisms, they might say, well, they're fairly opportunistic, and really, some of these fine details won't really matter in terms of the sort of opportunities they take. Um, so we're looking at those differences, and what it's, tell what it's going to tell us is how the differences of, say, polyethylene terephthalate, this plastic that's more dense than water that ends up in water often, um, is that better or worse than, say, polylactic acid, which is, a, new, which is a, a newer used material, not a new material, but it's a newer used material. It's a bio biodegradable material, but biodegradable 
in certain chemical conditions or certain conditions, and we were having a chat about this during the break actually, but polydynamic acid in some cases may be better for these animals. I'm not here to speak about better or worse for anything else, but in this one tight knit scenario, this is what I'm talking about. So the, 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 the ecologies of these animals alone, um, it, it might be worse because it might be that they take these plastics more or perhaps that they get less food because it's likely that organisms wouldn't grow as well or wouldn't do as well on the surface of PLA. Um, and, and there's various different reasons for that. <coughs> and then it, as part of that as well, the coronavirus in our lab will look to see a, a, the ingestion of these plastics and see how they'll take them and we'll monitor their growth and reproduction. You see, why this is now why this is now where it is, or where, where, why we're doing this at this point in, in the research, is because as these plastic studies have gone on and on, and we've done more and more, we're now adding a couple of more, you add more and more variables, and there's more things, and we're thinking about biofilms, we're thinking about the sediment, we're thinking about the water, and we have the facilities to do this at the CEH, um, to run these, to, to make it more never close, because once we've done the experiment, we can now say this is what we think. We know that it's not we know that it's not wrong, but we don't know that it's right. And I think that's kind of the case with everything. So that's that's what's going on there and that's the experiment that's gonna work. We're gonna be trying to get much closer to the the variables that are existing in the real world. Um, another thing, so this, that's the research that's going on in Mumbai, that's what the, the next experiment that's coming up. Um, and we're, we're, we're going to try and reach out to people uh, to get involved with that experiment as well. Um, maybe go into a little bit more detail of that when we'll have a chat with you. Um, this is the Phytoplastic Project. This is something else that's going on with the Windermere. So this is a freshwater project and what we're looking at is, or what Veronica Namba from um, Milan University is looking at. And, as part of that, ask different freshwater ecologists from around Europe to go to their lake, we have Windermere, and have a look at some of the plastics that they have and see these algae that grow on the surface of these plastics and some other things um, on, on, on a larger scale plastic, more for the ecology of the microorganism, thinking about them as opposed to thinking about the impact for the macroinvertebrates. Um, and this is just from their website, that, that, that's just, this is just the information on that, but that, that does describe it. And this is just some pictures, so this was, um, I can't remember what lake this was, and I didn't write it down, I, I was thinking about it in the car, and I was thinking, I can't remember the name of this, where, where this was, and I, I didn't have it as I came to the door, but I'll try and get that for you, and see if I can somehow get it to you. But this is one of the lakes and a bit of the research that they're looking at, and I think that's a control, because they're using a glass control, so they're comparing the, the substrate of the glass, the, the, the growth of the organisms on the glass to the to two different kinds of plastic. Um, this is their online presence um, and Windermere, that's going to be included in that. It's likely that that sort of thing will be maybe available six months from now as to when that's that sort of finished and you see some data around Windermere and around maybe some of the rivers as well um, in terms of the organisms that grow on some of these plastics. Um, and that's and that's that. So, just to sort of wrap things up a little bit, um, in the first part, we had the we had to look at plastics and microplastics and where they sit in the world and how they what their sources are, their transport, and, and where they end up, and then the interactions with these animals, um, which led us into the impact on the macroinvertebrates that are in Morgan Bay. Um, and I talked a little bit about the, the study, the, the experiment that I'm going to be doing, which looks at the palatability and so the way they uptake it and how the, and, and the impact on some of their growth and survival and, and how we'll be measuring that. And that, that pretty much covers us off. But I think the one thing I sort of do want to say is that I, would say, I don't have any opinions toward before this about plastics or whether or what materials we should be using or shouldn't be using or what we should be doing or shouldn't be doing. Um, 
with these animals in, in these regions, I've, I'm interested in what they're doing, and there's definitely implications in the real world. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm the best to, to say whether what should be done or shouldn't be done. But plastics are definitely entangled with human life. And it's done great benefits and great things for lots of people, lots of everywhere. Um, and it might just be that we've outweighed the negative impacts of it, or, or not. We don't really know yet in terms of lots of things, but for these animals, we're getting close to that truth. Um, and that's me, yeah, that's the lecture. Thank you.